Hebrews. I'm in Daniel. We that's that's probably not going to work. Hebrews 11. There we go. Um, been studying through this uh, book. Jesus is greater is kind of what we've seen from the get go. Uh, only two chapters left to go after we finish chapter 11. Uh, two more chapters. That could be uh, two weeks. It could be. 12 weeks, but we'll see. But uh, So we're going to look tonight at uh, verses 28, 29, 30, and 31, a whopping four verses. And we're going to look at the topic of faith is the victory. Faith is the victory. When we receive Christ as our Savior, life as we know it changes. It takes faith to accept Christ. And then your life, the way I say it changes, is then you start living your life by faith. Uh, as before, you know, it wasn't really a thing. It wasn't something that you did. It wasn't something you paid attention to. Uh, as, as a saved person, you live your life on the basis of faith. Everything we do. Why do we do it? Well, because we believe in a God that we've never seen, right? Uh, we trust in a God that's given us promises. And, and so we live our lives accordingly based on that faith. Uh, we cannot live the Christian life in our own strength. Now, we often try, don't we? And we often fail. Uh, we cannot do it on our own. Uh, the problems and the difficulties of life are too hard, too complicated, too big, uh, too overwhelming to try to do it on our own. Uh, we've got to depend on God daily. And I'm thankful that we have a God, number one, we can depend on. And number two, that wants us to depend on him. Uh, he's not a stingy God up in heaven. Well, I don't want to help you today. You know, he's not like that. Uh, he's always in the helping business, and we're thankful for that. Uh, we've, we've just kind of talked about Moses last week, uh, and we're going to kind of continue as we start this. We're going to look at Moses as well, uh, getting into uh, verse number 28. But uh, Moses lived by faith, even in the Old Testament days. Uh, many others in the Old Testament days, we lived by faith. You remember, we've talked about several that God gave them a promise. They lived their life believing that promise, but they never saw it happen in their lifetime. Uh, but they lived a life of faith anyways. And we're going to look at this chapter here, these few verses, uh, and see what faith can do, not just for individuals, but also for a family, for an entire nation. Uh, the power of faith and how victorious it can make us in our Christian lives. So let's look at verse number 28. We'll start there. And just give you three quick thoughts tonight, and then when I finish up, we'll, uh, we'll turn it over to Nolan and get our third quarter uh, business meeting out of the way and taken care of for this quarter, all right? So look at verse number 28. Through faith, he kept the Passover. This is referring back to Moses we had just talked about in the last few verses. Through faith, he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. Uh, number one, as we think about faith is the victory, faith brings us out. And, of course, we look at uh, what does that as Calvary. Uh, what Jesus Christ did for us on Calvary is what brings the uh, unsaved uh, sinner away from God, brings them to God when they put their faith in that. So, so faith brings us out, Calvary. Uh, Moses here in verse number 28, of course, we go back to Exodus chapter 12. You see some of this. Uh, but by faith, Moses observed the very first Passover. Now, I'm not Jewish, but to this day, I know the Jewish people still celebrate Passover. Uh, all these many, many, many years later. Uh, but Moses was the one that partook in the very first one. In Exodus chapter 12 gives us that historical account of the first Passover there. And uh, the reference that you see made to is the Passover lamb. The Passover lamb. And what I see here in, in this verse, just this one simple verse, and we think about the importance of faith bringing us out, uh, I see two particular aspects of the blood of the Passover lamb. Number one... Number one, that blood had to be shed. It had to be shed. Uh, of course, we refer to Jesus often, and we talk about how uh, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. And many churches and religions, they have taken the blood out of their songs, the blood out of their preaching, uh, the blood out of everything. And without the blood, we're, we're lost. Uh, and, and so we've got to have the shedding of blood. We see that for Christ. We see this all the way back to the Passover lamb, uh, Exodus chapter 12. If, if you have a Bible and you want to turn there, I want to show you something I thought was relatively neat in Exodus chapter 12. Uh, you have a, you have a, am I cutting in and out? I thought I was too. Larry? Come on, Larry. Get, get this fixed. All right. Um, hang on. We, get, we got me now? I, if not, I can just switch to the pulpit. I'm not going to go anywhere. Okay. Can you hear me now? All right. Am I cutting out now? 
I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. All right. Exodus chapter 12. If we do it again later, I'll just switch over to the pulpit if it cuts out. Uh, Exodus chapter 12. I, I'm going to take you back to this passage of the Passover lamb because when we think about the blood having to be shed, I, I read this, um, these few verses in Exodus chapter 12, uh, verse 3 through 5, and I want you to notice the progression of thought in these verses. Um, and to me, I think this is important because how often do we, do we preach and do we teach uh, a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? And, and we teach that God is a personal God and he's involved in our individual lives. Uh, this actually, this thought goes all the way back to the Passover lamb. Look at Exodus chapter 12. If, if, you've, if you've got a Bible, turn it with me. I don't have it on the screen here for you. Uh, but look at verse 3. Uh, Moses, of course, he, he's getting all these things done with the, with the Passover. Here's some of the instructions that are given. And, and the Lord tells Moses, Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man. Who's got their Bible open? What's the next two words? According. What is it? A lamb. A lamb. A lamb. According to the house of their fathers. What's the next two words? A lamb, A lamb for an house. So the progression in verse number three starts with a lamb, a lamb. Look at verse number four. And if the household be too little for, what's the next two words? The lamb. The lamb. Let him and his neighbor next unto him's house take it according to the number of the souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your count for the lamb. The lamb. Look at verse number five. Your lamb. your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You shall take it from the sheep. Or from the goats. Do you see the progression of thought? Yeah. This Passover lamb started as a lamb. The thought process then changed to it's the lamb. This is, this is the most important lamb you're going to run across this year. And then it finishes the thought with this is your lamb. This is your lamb. And, and, and if this isn't personal for you, you're, you know, you're in trouble. And so that's the progression of thought when you think about the shedding of blood. Uh, now, when you correlate that to Christ, here's a simple thought, the simple truth. Jesus is our Savior. He's our Lamb, okay? But just because He's the Savior doesn't mean He's my Savior, okay? I have to make Him my Savior. I have to accept Him as my Savior, See, knowing of God and knowing of the Savior and knowing what Jesus did on Calvary those many years ago, knowing of the blood that was shed, that's all wonderful. But if I haven't applied that and if I haven't accepted that by faith through grace, uh, then, then it doesn't mean no good. So, so Jesus is the Savior, okay? Forget the up part because he's not us. He's the Savior. But, but I have to make him my Savior. And you have to make him your Savior. Uh, three things I want you to notice about the Passover lamb real quick. And, of course, as you see these, these, this is a great parallel, once again, a great picture of Christ because Christ does the exact same thing when he dies for us on, on Calvary. Uh, look at three aspects of this. I might have them all up here at the same time. I do. Number one, that, that, that Passover lamb was a substitute. Yeah. It died so the firstborn didn't have to. Okay? Without the blood on the post, the firstborn child was killed. By the way, yeah. lest, lest somebody think, you know, well, that was just for the Egyptians. No, that was, that was, that was nationwide. Egyptian and Jew alike. If the blood wasn't applied, the firstborn was, 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 was killed. Okay? So this lamb was a substitute. It was a replacement. It took the place of the death of another. Uh, number two, and we see this in our verse that we read, it was spotless, without blemish. Without blemish. Uh, no broken bones. Uh, no, no scabs, no scars. You know, all that, nothing. Spotless. That's right. And, 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 and by the way, think about it. Jesus had to be spotless. He had to be sinless. He couldn't go to the cross and die for us if he had sin in his life. And so he had to be the perfect uh, substitute there. So we see he was a substitute. The lamb was a spotless, and then the lamb was slaughtered. Now, I know that's an S, you know, to get all the S's to match up, but when you think of the word slaughtered, I don't think of, you know, like, you know, like when you eat a little, have you ever seen the dainty little person eat the little steak? You know, they take the little knife and. Okay, that's not slaughter. <laughs> yeah, Terry's like, nope, never done that. Yeah, me either. <laughs> slaughter, you think about a slaughter and you think, uh, you think about blood everywhere. Yeah. You think about animals screaming and squalling and, you know, uh, you think of pain and you think of just nasty, gross, grotesque. I don't want to walk into this scene, yeah. right? That's the Passover lamb. Yeah. And if you really think about what Christ endured as our spotless lamb, 
This, the crucifixion was not a, 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 a patty cake death. Uh, this was horrible. It was horrendous. Uh, probably the, the most brutal death a person could die was crucifixion. But on top of it, all the other things they did to him before he was crucified. Our lamb was slaughtered, <laughs> okay? And, and so faith brings us out. Calvary does that for us. Sp uh, the Passover lamb, first of all, the blood had to be shed. Secondly, the blood of the Passover lamb had to be sprinkled. Had to be sprinkled. Um, the command was given for the sprinkling of the blood on the doorposts of the homes. That would protect them when the death angel passed over. The death angel was coming no matter what. Your choice was protect your family or don't. And that choice was made by a very simple application. We'll, we'll, do what, we'll do what God's told us to do. We'll take that lamb, whether it be us alone or us and a neighbor, depending on family size, because they had to eat some of that and all that type of thing as well. Uh, depending on how all that worked, we'll take that blood. We'll put it on our doorpost after we've got that Passover lamb to be our substitute. That was the choice they had to make. And, you know, we have the same choice with salvation today, don't we? God doesn't force it on us. God will not make us. We have a choice to make. Will I apply the blood or not? <laughs> it's pretty simple. Uh, so that blood had to be sprinkled. Uh, the blood of the lamb, number two, had to be applied. Yeah. It did no good to kill the lamb. Uh, you had to sprinkle. You had to put it on the doorpost. There were was, there was clear instructions given by Christ. Uh, and again, the same thing applies to our spotless lamb, Jesus Christ, on Calvary. We know he died. We know he shed his blood. We know the slaughter that took place. Amen. But if we haven't applied it to our hearts, the knowledge is great, but it doesn't do us any good. It has to be applied. Has to be applied. Uh, and then thirdly, faith in Christ, of course, uh, brings us out of sin and death. Uh, nothing will break the chains of sin except Jesus Christ. Amen. Nothing brings victory over death except Jesus Christ. Uh, and so faith brings us out. When I put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ, I, I, I know I can expect and I can believe that he keeps his word. He will bring me out of sin. He will bring me out of death. I don't have to fear that anymore. And I'm no longer a bond slave or a servant to sin and to Satan. Uh, and that's what the blood does. So, so faith brings us out, number one. Number two, look at verse 29. Oh, let me get back there. Whoop. Verse 29. By faith, they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, which the Egyptians, are saying to do, were drowned. What an awesome verse, right? We love the story of the Red Sea, don't we? Uh, number two, not only does faith uh, bring us out, faith brings us through. And we see an example of bravery in verse number 29. Uh, the children of Israel were doing something they probably weren't real comfortable doing. And I, I know it's something they'd never done before. <laughs> okay, uh, Came to this big body of water as they're fleeing Egypt. Egyptian army is coming behind them. They're fearing for their lives, and you know God just opens up the water. You know, uh, Walking through a not just muddy ground either, dry ground. What an amazing miracle. But still, it took bravery for the nation of Israel to step out into that. Okay? Can you imagine, can you imagine stepping off that seashore, just that first step or two, seeing the walls of water walled up around you, thinking, hearing it, hearing it still rumbling and, and, and crashing where it was standing, and, and the ground is dry, and you're thinking, how long is this going to last? Am I going to get 100 feet in? This is going to fall. Well, yeah. This is an act of faith. It's an act of faith. But that act of faith brought them through the Red Sea. And got them to the promised land. Had they not crossed the Red Sea, they wouldn't have gotten to the promised land. And so this is the first step there, this bravery that they showed. So look at a couple of thoughts. First of all, I want to look at the brave saints. The brave saints. Verse number 29 is a picture of brave saints. Uh, they stepped out in faith. They followed in obedience to what God told them to do through their leader, Moses. They followed. They trusted. They obeyed. God blessed. But it was a brave thing to do, to, to, to follow this command. Uh, there's a lot of things we are called by God to do in our Christian lives today that require a little bit of an element of bravery. <laughs> uh, a little bit of, I'm going to step out in faith and boldness, even though I don't know what I'm getting into because I can trust God. Uh, and so this is a picture of, of brave saints. Uh, let me say a couple things. First of all, being a Christian does not remove the difficulties of life. We probably understand that being a Christian, the type of Christian we should be, usually brings more difficulties to life. You know, the Bible teaches that if we live godly in Christ Jesus, we shall suffer persecution. Uh, so, so we understand that the world hated him. Jesus says, going to hate you because they hated me. Uh, so being a Christian doesn't remove difficulties. So we need to learn this lesson of faith from these brave saints. When God says do it, just do it. 
When God says, I know this requires great faith, just step out in faith. God knows what he's doing. Uh, and, and we can really learn from these brave saints uh, how to step out in faith and allow God to do the rest. Uh, we see it in their life. So we see brave saints. Uh, secondly, uh, you, you'll see this fact uh, when you think about it being a picture of brave saints. Uh, you and I may panic sometimes. God never panics. Do you realize there's never been one time in heaven where God said, whoops, or, oh, oh my. <laughs> or, oh, I can't believe that. Or, ah! <laughs> Never. You and I have been to those places in our lives. You and I have grabbed a hold of that last handful of hair that we had. And it was pulling and yanking. And what am I going to do? I don't. Not God. Not God. God never panics. God never panics. I uh, put this, this is, this is good, okay, so, so may, it's on your paper, so you don't have to write the whole thing down, but I like this. Um, uh, there we go, letter A. There's no panicking in heaven, only planning. <laughs> the reason God doesn't panic is because he has a plan, sure. all right? Uh, and his plans from the beginning of time to the end, of, uh, he, he, it's all planned. <laughs> he knows it, okay? So there's no panicking in heaven, uh, only planning. We all have times in our lives, we all face times in our lives where we don't know what to do. We've all been there. And if you say, I haven't, well, you're probably fibbing. Uh, and if you say, well, I'm not there right now, that's great. It's probably going to come again, <laughs> okay? There's going to come times in our life where we, we're up against the wall. We're, we're right at our wits end. I don't know what to do. I'm thankful that we have a God that does. I, I'm thankful we have a God that we can trust, a God that never panics. And if we'll just step out in faith, if we'll just trust and obey, God does the rest. Many times because of, uh, of those feelings, we feel trapped in our circumstances, and we so, we're so focused on the negative circumstances that we're facing, we take our eyes off the creator of the circumstances. We take our eyes off the creator of our, of our lives and, and the master and the savior of our lives. And boy, doubt starts to raise to, to the surface and faith starts to squish down. And we're like, wah! And we feel trapped. And we start to panic many times. I'm glad, again, God never panics. I'm glad he knows what he's doing. Even, even when I'm in the midst of a full-blown panic attack, God knows exactly what he's going to do. And we ought to be thankful for that. Remember this. God will part the waters. He has a plan. You think Israel knew what was going to happen when they got to the Red Sea? No. 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 And, and just like when you face your Red Sea, probably not what the Israelites face, but when you face your Red Sea, I don't know what to do. I feel trapped. I'm not sure which way to go. When you face that, I'm thankful we have a God that can still part the waters today. Amen. Step right into the situation and say, you know what? Let me take care of it. Just, just follow me. <laughs> just follow me. Never panics. Brave saints. Faith brings us through. Brave saints. Look at this aspect, though. And I like the correlation that we're given in verse number 29 because you see, you see both sides. Uh, it talks about these brave saints. But then secondly, it talks about brazen sinners, the Egyptians. The Egyptians tried to do the very same thing that the Israelites did just in front of them. Right? The walls of water are, are up. The dry ground is there. Hey, let's go get them. Their God made a path for us. Let's go get them. Brazen sinners. The same water that delivered Israel drowned the Egyptians. This was not a, a, a something, you know, weird that God brought out of the sky. You know, he didn't send uh, uh, snakes. Uh, you know, there were uh, no poison darts. Uh, the same water that he used to deliver Israel... He used them to destroy and drown the Egyptians. Uh, that water, of course, always reminds me of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we think about that when we get baptized. You know, we're, we're buried, buried with him in baptism. We're raised to walk in newness of life. And, of course, we see through that also we see great victory in Jesus uh, when we truly step out and obey him. Uh, we're thankful for that brazen, brazen sinners. The waters that delivered Israel drowned the Egyptians. Secondly, um, those waters don't open for those who reject Christ. The Egyptians were not there because they were following God. <laughs> they were there to recapture their slaves. Okay? Just because God is a God of love, and just because God made the way of salvation so simple, does not mean everybody will be saved. Now, he wants everybody to. I want everybody to. But we also have read scripture to where we realize everybody will not. And those that reject Christ, the, the waters uh, will never open for them. 
uh, those, those problems that they face, those times where they're lost in their circumstances, don't know what to do, uh, and they're not going to get brought through. It's not going to happen without knowing Christ as Savior. Uh, we ought to be thankful once again that faith brings us uh, uh, through, and faith brings us out. And then look at, um, look at number three, verse 30 and 31. Look at one more, one more fact about faith here. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they were compassed about seven days. By faith, the harlot Rahab perished not with them that believed not when she had received the spies with peace. Number three, faith brings us in. Victory. It brings us out of sin. It brings us through the trials, through the circumstances. And it brings us in where God needs us to be. And gives us victory. The first thing the children of Israel encountered when they crossed the Jordan uh, River to enter the promised land, that land that flowed with milk and honey, that promised land that they wandered 40 years to finally get to because they were so knuckleheaded in the first place, right? They finally get there. And just like the Red Sea was an obstacle, and even the Jordan River was an obstacle, they get across it, they get ready to go into that promised land, and what do they encounter? Jericho. Jericho. Uh, the very first thing they encountered after they crossed the Jordan River was the city of Jericho. Uh, this was a stronghold. This was a massive city with massive walls, massive protection, massive defenses. You were not getting into Jericho. It, it, it was a city that was built to sustain attack from the enemy. Uh, Christian, know this in your life. There's always going to be obstacles. There's always going to be strongholds. There's always going to be things that we face in our life that look to us with our human eyes insurmountable. I, I can't win this victory. It's not going to happen. But I'm thankful that faith gives victory as an option. Because it's never faith in me. It's always faith in him. And we've truly put our faith in him. We can see victory as an option. Faith brings us in. Look at, look at two things we see here in this passage, these two verses. And it just kind of shows you how, how, how awesome faith is in bringing victory into the, into the life of the believer. First of all, you see the collapse of the stronghold. Uh, victory over Jericho. By the way, and I know you know the story. It's old. We don't have to rehash the whole thing, okay? They, they saw the stronghold collapse and never, never raised a weapon. Okay? Never had a military strategy. Never sent, uh, uh, sent somebody behind for an ambush so when they brought them out, they get attacked from both sides. They didn't have flaming arrows and, and catapults. Okay? They walked in circles. Or square, if it was a square city. I, I don't know. Okay? They walked around the city of Jericho, the walled city. And at the right appropriate moment, they all shouted. Now, I want you to think for just a minute. Before they were to shout, every time they walked around that city, they had to do it in complete silence. Yeah. Now, think about that for just a minute. Mm -hmm. How many of you have that one person that you know, if I was put in a room with this person and told we were not allowed to talk, we're going to lose real quick. Yeah. We're not allowed to make a sound. You know, you know that person, goes, it's over, right? Now, think about this. Uh, there were women there. I'm just kidding. I'm just teasing. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Macho men. I can walk faster than you can, you know. I'll walk carrying it. Think about all, the, all the, the different dynamics of people that were there. As they walked around the city in complete silence. And then on that last lap, that seventh day, they shouted and the trumpets blared. And they stood back and all they did was watch. With their mouths open and their eyes as big as saucers as the walls came tumbling down. <laughs> victory. Yeah. Yeah. Victory. Uh, the walls fall. By the way, think about it now, okay? The, the military for Jericho are on those walls, many of them. Just inside those walls, many of them. Think how many military were just killed just with the collapsing of the walls before Israel even entered the city. Okay? The collapse of a stronghold. Uh, victory over Jericho. Because of that, they got to uh, continue then taking over and going into the promised land. Uh, Canaan is, a, uh, is always a picture of the life of the believer. Canaan land, the promised land. That's the life of the believer. Um, but here's what we have to understand. It's characterized by faith. 
The life of the believer is characterized by faith. The entrance to Canaan was characterized by faith. Each step of the way, you see great faith. The class of stronghold. Faith brings victory. Look at, look at this one. Look at verse 31. We read it a minute ago about Rahab. The conversion of a sinner. The conversion of a sinner. Aren't you thankful that we have a God that is powerful enough? We talk about how his power and his omnipotence and his might and his strength. But he's powerful enough to take the life of a person who does not know him, who does not love him, who lives in sin, and to change their life. And wash them clean. And give them a new family and adopt them into the family. Think about a God that has the power to do that. The conversion of a sinner through faith. Rahab. Rahab uh, made a decision when those spies were there. That decision was based on in faith. It was based in faith. And because of that, we see Rahab's uh, future was drastically different than the rest of the Jerichoites. <laughs> Jerichoians, whatever you want to call them, right? Totally different. She survived. And by the way, you, you, want, you, you want to talk about how, how awesome, how victorious faith is? She was told that anybody that's in your household with you will survive. Her faith saved not just her life, but the lives of anybody who would listen to her and gather with her that day. Conversion of a sinner. Today, unfortunately, in our world, in our society, we brag about things that ought to make us ashamed. It doesn't take you too long talking to a worldly person for them to start bragging about some sin they committed this weekend. And you're like, wow, man, if I said that, I'd, I'd turn red. My, my mama would slap me or roll over in her grave one. You know, that's not, we don't talk about that. But today, sin has become a mockery. Sin has become a fun. Sin has become bragging rights. What can I do and get away with and then brag to my friends about? And you think, think about it. Things that used to make uh, people blush years ago. Uh, think about how, how far away from that we've become. Right? Uh, we brag about sin that ought to make us ashamed. Uh, when, when Rahab was converted, here's, here's another thing we need to see about her. Matthew chapter 1 talks about it. Rahab becomes included in the family tree of Jesus. Okay? So think about that for just a minute. Her life before was not a very glamorous one. It's one that most Christians today would look at and say, I don't want her to be, I don't want her to sit in the pew next to me at church. Right? I'm not, I'm not picking her up and bringing her to church. She's got to find her own way there. That's, that's what most of us would do. Right? And yet, she steps out in faith and, and does what she needs to do. And she is gloriously saved and changed and, and is directly put into the, the, the lineage of Jesus Christ. Amen. Isn't it amazing what Christ can do with a sinner when he, when he converts them? Isn't that awesome? You don't have to have a past like Rahab to have a great future like she got. You just have to be willing to step out in faith and say, yes, Lord, I trust you. And he can take the past and make it new and give us a great future that's ahead. Uh, that is what Jesus can do for the sinner. That's what Jesus can do for the sinner. By the way, let me, let me just say this. I'm done. I'm out, of, I'm out of points. I'm out of blanks. I'm out of outline, okay? The church cannot do this for the sinner. Okay? Religion cannot do this for the sinner. Baptism cannot do this for the sinner, okay? Jesus, in the life-changing application of the blood of Christ to our hearts, is the only thing that can do this. And I'm thankful that through faith, he brings us out of the bonds of sin, out of the fear of death. I'm thankful that through faith, uh, he brings us through all of our trials and all of our problems with, with really with glowing reports if we'll trust him. And I'm thankful that faith brings us to victorious things in our life. Not just heaven. That's, that's, a, that's a great victory, right? But every step of the Christian life, we can experience victory because of faith. Moses did it. Rahab did it. Many other names. Abraham we've talked about. Many other names mentioned in, in, in Hebrews chapter 11. All because of faith. Faith is the victory. Faith is the victory. And I think it will do us good every now and then just to remind ourselves, hey, what can I do to strengthen my faith? And maybe even, I know this is hard, this is hard to, to, this is hard to say and to do, but maybe even ask God occasionally, God, what can you do to stretch my faith? I really need to grow in faith. Can you stretch that? Can you stretch? He'll stretch you. He'll, you may not like it, but boy, if we'll let him do it and we'll go through it with him, the, the blessings that, that, that abound are wonderful. 
if we truly grow in our faith. Next week, we are going to finish chapter 11. Woo! Yes! Always faithful. Always faithful. We're going to continue that theme. Of course, that's what chapter 11 is about, really. Uh, and we're going to look at always faithful and uh, just a handful of verses, but it'll finish off chapter 11. All right. We got all of our blanks filled in tonight? Yes? yes. Questions? All right. I'm going to. Oh, yes, ma'am. Let's have prayer real quick. Uh, and then when I'm done, we'll turn it over to Nolan and get our business meeting out of the way. Um, Oh, you're good. Um, I'll, just, I'll just say this now um, before I pray, and that way when I'm done, he can just come and go uh, get, get started. Have prayer, and then uh, we'll, we'll jump right in and get that taken care of tonight. Father, we love you. We thank you, God, for being so good to us. And, Lord, I do pray tonight that you will strengthen our faith. Uh, Lord, as, as has been even mentioned tonight, we, we struggle with it. We do. And we have to be honest with ourselves, Lord. None of us are strong enough in our faith as we need to be and could be. So we pray that daily, you, oh Lord, that you'll grow us and stretch us and uh, teach us in this area of faith, Lord. And may we truly rely on you uh, the way that we need to and trust you the way that we should. Uh, Father, we thank you for this lesson now tonight. We pray that we can use it and apply it to just again remind us and strengthen us in this area of faith. We ask you to uh, bless the remainder of our service now as we go over our, our finances for the last quarter, Lord, and just bless this, this business meeting. And uh, Lord, then dismiss us as we go home tonight, we pray. And we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.